Good morning, thank you for spending your morning with us. My name is Pat Young. I'm the Assistant Planning Director uh, for the City County Planning Department, and I'm going to be the moderator of this morning's event. Uh, as I said, thank you so much for coming out this morning in support of this important event. Um, I first want to thank Self Help Credit Union. Give a round of applause for sponsoring us today. couple pieces of housekeeping. Most of you probably know that the restrooms are to my left and the rear. Uh, secondly, uh, as you came in, you received two index cards. And there should be enough pens for everybody. If there's not, ask for your, ask for your neighbor. Um, the, one index card has lines. The other one does not have lines. <laughs> there will be a test on this. Um, <laughs> if you have questions for our panel, our expert panel that will have at the end of the presentation, Please write those questions on the card with the lines. And at the end of Aaron Kane's presentation, Aaron, if you do not recognize yourself there, um, pass those to the end of the table, and Julia Black and Susan Willard of our staff will collect those um, so that we can address your questions to our panel. The other card with no lines, if you have any issues you want us to get addressed as we proceed in this process, concerns about affordable housing transit. Um, issues you want to make sure that we address as we go forward in our planning for affordable housing near transit. Please make sure you write those issues on those comment cards and drop them in the green basket that's on the table in the rear on the way out of the presentation. At the end of our presentation, we'll also have our uh, contact information and website address. Um, what I want to emphasize right now is this is the beginning of the beginning. Aaron King's going to go over a four-part city-county strategy to look at ways we can preserve and and create affordable housing near transit. And this meeting is just the kickoff of that strategy, framing and giving an overview of the issue and talking a little bit about the economics of development of affordable housing. Um, so I, I want to thank our city and county partner department, uh, our city, specifically thank our city and county partner departments, uh, Office of Economic and Workforce Development and Community Development. The thing I can say unequivocally about this subject matter of affordable housing and transit is partnerships and collaboration are critical. They're essential. And uh, under the leadership of the city and county manager's offices, um, we have city and county departments engaged with us, uh, planning as the facilitator and convener, but there are um, really almost a dozen city and county departments that will have a role as we go forward in this uh, effort. So I want to thank the city and county manager's offices, our partners in community development, and the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. I also want to thank our community partners. Um, you see some of the, the folks listed here, Triangle Transit, the Durham Housing Authority, um, Durham CAN, uh, Durham Community Land Trust, and the Triangle J Council of Governments. There are many others, almost too many to mention. Durham CARES, uh, Legal Aid of North Carolina, Housing for New Hope. Um, the Durham community, these partners have done tremendous advocacy, research, evaluation, and, and really helped Durham and Coeys to be a leader in the area of affordable housing and transit. I want to relate a quick anecdote on Barris Commissioner Rec options here. Um, Legal Aid of North Carolina sponsored an informal brown bag event at the end of July on the issue of affordable housing and transit. They brought in a nationally renowned expert by the name of Sarita Turner, who's pictured here on the slide. Ms. Turner is uh, from California, has been working in this field for over 20 years. She was providing us with a, an overview of best practices from the 29 communities that have uh, implemented or planned for affordable housing um, since 1989. And she gave us some great information. And uh, Commissioner Recca, who just walked in, <laughs> I'm, I'm in the middle of embarrassing you, actually. Um, Commissioner Recca very rightly asked, so Ms. Turner, which other communities started this process of looking at affordable housing or transit so early in the planning process so we can reach out to those communities and, and find out their experience? Ms. Turner, scratched her head for a minute and said, none, there's no community. And then there's no community in the country who's looked at this issue as early on, 12 plus years in advance of the train, uh, as Durham is. And that's to Durham's credit. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> we're starting at the right time. And, and as everybody in this room, I think, knows, we're already beginning to see this here in Durham. We have almost 2,700 uh, multifamily units coming on in the next 18 months near 9th Street downtown, and only about 3% of those are affordable folks at 60% of the area median income. And 
those are those are properties that are being developed um, in the South Side Project under the city's auspices. So it, it's already a concern, and it's going to become more so one as we go forward. Um, another consideration here is that today, not in the future, but today, the median household income of, of households that are currently within a half mile of these future friend transit areas, the 11 light rail station areas in, in Durham, uh, are much lower than the Durham County average. So what, what you see is these areas are, are, are home to a lot of folks uh, who are relying on affordable housing uh, that's either currently subsidized or what I would call organically affordable, meaning the market hasn't, uh, hasn't yet raised the prices so much that they can't afford to live there. Uh, and, and much higher percentage of renters relative to homeowners. Of course, if you're a renter, you're uh, much more likely to be able to be displaced if market conditions change and the person who owns your property wants to redevelop it at a, at a higher, more costly, and more, more valuable use. And finally, and very importantly, you have a much higher percentage of folks that uh, rely on transit for their uh, access to employment and daily necessities. And uh, I think this is an absolutely essential piece. So two to three times in most of our station areas where folks don't own a personal vehicle and really um, need to have access to transit. And they're currently relying on um, the, the bus system to, to provide that or, or just for walking. So where does that leave us? I think it leaves us with a situation where there's incredible community values from light rail. It's arguably, as I tried to argue earlier, a necessity for a competitive 21st century city to develop transit-oriented development near our rail stations. But you have a situation where that, uh, that is going to create displacement effects and, and force folks uh, out, uh, existing folks and folks that would like to live near transit in the future out of these areas. Uh, the only way to address this is through a, a attention to the issue of equity. And, you know, Durham is, is known uh, and much much to Durham's credit for always being concerned about equity. Is it just? Is it fair? Um, the sales tax is the primary way that the, that's the state, the way the state allowed us to help fund, locally fund this system. Everybody in here probably knows sales tax is progressive. If you're low to moderate income, you're probably paying a higher percentage of your income in sales tax than you would if you're a middle or upper income. So there are basic issues of fairness where the community uh, needs to ensure that the folks that are at all income strata have opportunities to access this incredibly valuable transit system in the areas of the transit system that provide these tremendous economic opportunities. Um, and you have my commitment on behalf of all my county and, and city colleagues that we're going to look at these issues as we go forward on the strategy you're going to hear about from Aaron Kane um, to, to look at the issues of equity the questions of equity and make sure that they're considered as we look at uh, investments going forward. So our, our elected officials uh, get this. Our elected officials get this. Um, and many of the folks in this room worked in advocacy for this uh, and adopted a very uh, ambitious uh, but appropriate uh, policy goal. Or, and, and that goal is to have at least 15% of all housing units within a half mile of each transit area to be affordable to folks at 60% of the area median income. And um, there's some good news. I think there's some good news to start with that. Um, this map shows that the properties in red are property, we define them as subsidized, which what that means is they're under the direct control of DHA, um, the city, or some other public entity, or they're under contractual obligation to stay affordable, either for a very long term or for perpetuity. So you've got almost over 13%, almost 2,000 units already today uh, within a half mile of transit areas that meet that criteria. Uh, and, and that's a, a great baseline to start from. Another thing you have that's not reflected on this map, uh, TJ Cog and others have done some great work and we will be producing some, some graphics and some data on this in the near future. But you have certainly hundreds, and I would probably, I would argue thousands, we'll have that data soon, of organically affordable um, units, meaning market rate affordable units, especially as you go far to West House Square and okay in Patterson Place, uh, that are today affordable and then we have the opportunity uh, to potentially uh, work with those folks to ensure that they stay affordable over time. Uh, another piece of, I think, of good news is uh, the evolving concept of what affordability means. Place, of course, is job one. Um, traffic congestion 
is demonstrably reduced, certainly when the system first comes in. Evidence research seems to suggest that peak hour traffic, your morning and evening commutes are, at least initially when the system is put in, are reduced. If any of you have sat on I-40 or I-85 during rush hour, you know how valuable that is. Um, reducing pollution per passenger mile, uh, light rail transit is 62% of invention districts because what they do is they create an environment where there's high density, compact development, walkable development, um, access to education and amenities, and um, high quality design. And what that does is foster an environment where um, businesses can collaborate um, both in proximity, meet over lunch, meet over coffee, uh, and have an environment where their businesses can thrive. And increasingly, the economic sectors, such as um, biopharmaceuticals, uh, medical research, biotechnology, and other tech sectors are, de are demanding these types of areas. Uh, additionally, uh, Gen Y, which is the largest generation in American history, 18 to 34, has a strong preference for this type of development. 62% um, in a recent poll by the Urban Land Institute favored uh, mixed-use development, walkable with shops, restaurants, and offices. And increasingly, the uh, baby boomer generation, age 50 to 68, the second largest generation in American history, as they were tied the fundamental issue that we didn't initially consider, and that was the effect of transit on land values uh, and housing costs. Uh, there was a 2004 review by a, a gentleman named Robert Severo, who's a transportation planning expert, uh, and he looked at um, about two dozen uh, communities and dozens of studies and, and showed that almost uniformly there is a significant increase in property values and housing costs uh, near, especially within a half mile of uh, transit areas. The effect he found was a range of 6 to 45 percent relative to similar, similar housing that was not in that distance. Um, the effect, the, the valuation increase effect, is enhanced if the transit system serves a lot of employment, which our system is designed to do. And um, it's also enhanced uh, for the, those properties that are closest to the driveway. That's the state, the way the state allowed us to help fund, locally fund this system. Everybody in here probably knows sales tax is progressive. If you're low to moderate income, you're probably paying a higher percentage of your income in sales tax than you would if you're in a lower upper income. So there are basic issues of fairness where the community uh, needs to ensure that the folks that are at all income strata have opportunities to access this incredibly valuable transit system in the areas near the transit system that provide these tremendous economic opportunities. Um, and you have my commitment on behalf of all my county and, and city colleagues that we're going to look at these issues as we go forward on the strategy you're going to hear about from Aaron Kane um, to, to look at the issues of equity, the questions of equity, and make sure that they're considered as we look at um, investments going forward. So our, our elected officials uh, get this. Our elected officials get this. Um, and many of the folks in this room worked in advocacy for this uh, and adopted a very uh, ambitious uh, but appropriate uh, policy goal, or, and, and that goal is to have at least 15% of all housing units within a half mile of each transit area to be affordable to folks at 60% of the area median income. And um, there's some good news. I think there's some good news to start with that. Um, this map shows that the properties in red are property we define them as subsidized, which what that means is they're under the direct control of DHA, um, the city, or some other public entity, or they're under contractual obligation to stay affordable either for a very long term or for perpetuity. So you've got almost over 13%, almost 2,000 units already today uh, within a half mile of transit areas that meet that criteria, uh, and, and that's a, a great baseline to start from. Another thing you have that's not reflected on this map uh, or what I would call organically affordable, meaning the market hasn't, uh, hasn't yet raised the prices so much that they can't afford to live there. Uh, and, and much higher percentage of renters relative to homeowners. And of course, if you're a renter, you're uh, much more likely to be able to be displaced if market conditions change and the person who owns your property wants to redevelop it at, at a higher, more costly, and more, more valuable use. And finally, and very importantly, even much higher percentage of folks that uh, rely on transit for their uh, access to employment and daily necessities. And uh, I think 
this is an absolutely essential piece. So two or three times in most of our station areas where folks don't own a personal vehicle and really um, need to have access to transit, and they're currently relying on um, the, the bus system to, to provide that or, or just with walking. So where does that leave us? I think it leaves us with a situation where there's incredible community values for light rail. It's arguably, as I tried to argue earlier, a necessity for a competitive 21st century city to develop transit-oriented development near our rail stations. But you have a situation where 12%. So this is happening across the country. And a lot of our peer cities have, have made this work and have seen tremendous benefits. Uh, this is Arlington, Virginia. This photo was taken in 2011. Um, the 1990s, early 2000s, they put in five metro rail stations uh, and saw three tremendous benefits. They took an approach very similar to what Durham is, is, is taking, which is encouraging. Most of you in this room have probably heard that the federal government identifies a, a threshold of 30%. You, should, if you, you shouldn't spend more than 30% of your income on housing and utilities. If you do spend more than 30%, you're cost burdened. Um, I think the evolving concept of this, and TJ Cox does some great work on this, is looking at housing, utilities, and transportation costs. Almost everybody in this room, probably those are your two highest uh, costs in your, in your household budget. So if you look at housing and transportation together, you've got up to 45% of your income is the accepted standard. Some people use 50. If you live near a transit area and you can organize your life to not have a vehicle, uh, you, can, you can afford to pay a little more in housing, and, and you'll, you're probably paying much less in transportation. Um, an all-access pass to most light rail systems nationally is in the ballpark of $100. Almost every car I've ever owned is cost more than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now, now, let's, now let's switch to the bad news. Um, as with almost every other, other city in America, um, the lowest income folks are the most cost burdened, uh, and that's no different in Durham. Uh, what this graphic shows is folks below that threshold of 39, 132, which is per year in income, is, which is very near 60% of our average median income, uh, are, are already cost burdened, and the, the lowest income folks are, are the most cost burdened, and they're competing for a very small pool of affordable units. Uh, and if you look at the metric I talked about a moment ago, this is data from TJ Cog. Uh, across all income strata in Durham, uh, meaning the richest to the poorest, 78% uh, of folks' uh, households are spending more than 45% of their income on housing and transportation. Um, what's happened in America for over 50 years is something that many of you all have heard of, drive to qualify. Folks will move farther out in the suburban fringe, get a bigger house, and then drive farther to get to employment. Um, that drives up transportation costs and create the effect you see here. So, uh, the transit system can also help, I think, bring that down uh, across the board as we see preferences switch to some to, tr to transit use. Yeah, so, is that, all that is all households. Yeah, it is. Um, so again, uh, I, I, we can break that out. We haven't done that yet. Um, I'll go back to the goal. Um, as a professional planner, this is the kind of goal we love because it's specific and it's actionable, and it gives us as staff. Uh, working with our colleagues in OEWD, CD, transportation, and other departments, uh, something very clear to shoot at. Um, but there are a lot of considerations um, that are going to have to be evaluated and we're going to get significant community input on. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll leave it at this. The, the, the cost of meeting the stated goal and, in my opinion, the, the likely success or the outcomes of meeting the goal are going to be related to how the community values these different considerations and these different questions. Uh, there's no wrong answer. It's based on what, what we want to see uh, at these areas and what's important. Um, I'll, I'll use an example of our uh, sister city, Chapel Hill, uh, has, has since 2000 focused on, on, on two things. They focused on ensuring that the private sector bears the vast majority of the burden through the development process of, of paying for their affordable housing meeting the goals, and they focused on home ownership rather than uh, rental. And um, so that, that, that program is robust, it's thorough, they want to produce 235 units in, in 14 years. So the way you set up the various programs, you're going to hear from Dan, Jewel, and Aaron King, my colleagues, 
about more detail in this area. The way you set up the program will influence the costs and the outcomes. Uh, certainly today we're not at a point where we're looking at um, what those outcomes are going to be. We're kicking off the process to get community input to help frame, um, frame what we recommend to the administrations and selected officials. And of course, um, probably an obvious point, but I'll say it anyway, the tools we use to, to pursue this goal are going to be very different at different um, income levels. 60% um, of AMI is, is kind of where the, uh, the, the bottom of what the market can provide and where, where the issue of sub subsidy comes in, or equity gap, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, comes in. And above 60%, we do see the market creating more and more units, uh, although within these transit areas, you're probably getting closer to that 100 or even higher based on uh, current market trends. <coughs> So I talked about equity before, fairness and justice. Um, there's another definition of equity, and it's an important one to this subject. The, the common thread in all the solutions and all the strategies that we're going to talk about over the next, um, the rest of the presentation over the next year or two, as we, as we go through the planning process, is what I call the equity gap. Um, the difference between what a property is worth or it costs to rent and what someone can afford to pay or that an owner owns. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is I introduce Dan Jewell. Uh, I'll introduce him fully later as part of our panel, but Dan's a local landscape architect and uh, works with many local developers and has been involved in many uh, projects here in Durham to talk a little bit about um, how the development finance process is, uh, works and how this equity gap is created. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Good morning, everyone. How are you? So, um, about a month ago, Pat and Aaron asked if, uh, since I, I spent a lot of time in their office and, and they were getting tired of me, they decided to give me a little task to do. And they said, can you maybe put together a, a development scenario of what it actually takes to bring a project to market so that we could start defining just part of the problem that you're all here this morning to help us start addressing? As Pat said, this is, this is going to be a long journey. We're not looking for solutions this morning. What we're doing is we're identifying the need and the problem so that we can get where we need to be. And of course, I'll go ahead and advance the slide. What I've done is I've just taken a, uh, a, a, a prototypical, I didn't use a particular project. In fact, as you, as you uh, follow through my slides here, You'll see it's a project that I probably wouldn't actually want to attach my name to. But I, what I did was I just wanted to do a very diagrammatic representation of those costs that are involved in bringing a multifamily project to the market. It doesn't matter whether it's a for sale project or a rental project. It really doesn't matter whether it's a public sector private project, a private sector project, or a public-private partnership. All the costs are relatively the same. But as Pat said, there are real costs associated in creating a project, which also means that to have an affordable housing component, we need to be able to offset some of those costs so that at the end of the day, there is still an incentive for the developer, be that the public sector or the private sector, to do this project and to bring it to market. Uh, Durham has a, uh, a relatively rigorous regulatory environment, and on top of that, we have a very rigorous state regulatory environment, all which play into the costs that are associated. Now, what I'd like to do is go through relative costs. This is very simple. Many of you in the room know this already, and uh, apologize for the simplicity of it, but I think it's good to just put on the table the things that are involved in, in, uh, in, in putting this, this together. So let's start. So we start with a, a typical property that you might see on the Durham Chapel Hill light rail corridor, uh, the low density residential development of some kind or another. Uh, there'd be some houses on there, some existing structures that might need to go away. So one of the first, the very first uh, cost that you're gonna involve all obviously is the land cost. Pat had some graphs earlier which were quite interesting that show land cost is very variable. And particularly, 
as the light rail system starts to become real and those station sites that have been identified start getting more development pressure, those land costs could go up. So we could see a higher percentage than I've actually represented here in terms of land costs uh, actually uh, be part of the project cost burden. The next big group of costs that are involved also have a time factor involved. And those are all the costs involved with the due diligence on the property. Does it actually work? Does it have any environmental issues? Are there constraints that would prevent you from developing it or make it more expensive development? There's uh, costs involved with um, the design, architecture fees, traffic impact analysis fees, and keep in mind we're specifically talking about a project that would be proximate to a light rail site within this half mile walk zone, as Pat said. So we think what we're trying to do is to drive some density, is to drive ridership, because the first thing that we need to achieve as a community is to make sure that we get our light rail system approved, funded, and built. Otherwise, all of this conversation is for naught. So we are looking, we are looking, the, the, the federal government, who we hope to help fund this system, they are looking for a certain amount of density that will generate ridership to show that our light rail system is going to be viable and, vi viable and actually uh, bring riders to the table and provide this quality of life that, that Pat has been talking about. So we have all of these design fees that, that are involved with that, we have the environmental uh, investigations. What we also have, which is a very variable component, is the cost of financing. And the reason I threw a little clock up on top of that is that cost of financing is greatly affected by the time that it takes from starting a project to actually bringing it to market and starting to achieve some revenue. Um, in Durham, typically, it's about a year if there's not a rezoning involved. You could call it a year and a half if there is a rezoning involved just to get to the point where you have a building permit. If there's a contentious rezoning, it could happen even longer than that. Fortunately, Durham is not Chapel Hill. If we were looking at a Chapel Hill project, this would be two to three years to get to this piece, which is one of the reasons that Chapel Hill has decided to go a different way than we have right now on affordable housing, and that is to try and legislate it. I think Aaron will give you some numbers in a little bit, though, to, to, to show you that that has not been highly successful. He gave me a look that he's not. Uh, Pat had some numbers, but I believe, Pat, the number is over the last 20 years, uh, Chapel Hill has actually generated only about uh, 200, 235 affordable units over a 20 year period. So that's a model that may not work for Durham. So time is definitely money in this case. We've then got a component of the project, and again, the clock is still ticking while we're going here. We have all of the fees involved with going through the city process, the county process, the state permits, the other permits we need to get. DOT is a huge factor in that in terms of time and, uh, and things that we need to pay for. There are fees for zoning, for site plan approval. We may need use permits depending on the design of the project. There are fees from the inspections department and the public works department for construction plan approval. There are fees from the county or the state for grading permits and erosion control permits. And those things just start adding up over, over time as well. And again, we have not yet started building the project. Those are costs that are going to be incurred that will need to be financed before revenue comes up. There's another really big section of fees that contribute to the cost of a project, and those are various and sundry impact fees. And again, regardless of whether it's a public project or a private project, these are all going to contribute to the cost of bringing this project to the market. We have transportation impact fees. I've done some multifamily uh, projects where those impact fees have been hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they come out to many dollars per unit. There's a requirement that we have parks and recreation fees and open space fees. All told, those fees could add up to $2,000 a residential unit. So you can see those can be the trigger between whether a unit can be brought on affordably or non-affordably. 
All told, those fees could add up to $2,000 a residential unit. So you can see those can be the trigger between whether a unit can be brought on affordably or non-affordably. Water and sewer fees are fairly big in Durham. Uh, uh, as much as $100,000 for a water water meter and a, and a sewer tank fee for a, a large project that needs a lot large water meter. Stormwater facility fees. Durham, fortunately, is at the cutting edge of uh, managing our stormwater to uh, keep the nutrients and the silt and things down in, in Jordan Lake and Falls Lake, but there's a cost associated with that. One of those costs is that the Public Works Department requires that for every stormwater facility we build, there be a fee to get that approved and, uh, and review our plans. But there's another huge cost component to that, and that is that they require a surety. A surety is a guarantee, money in the bank, so that if that facility is not maintained in the future and repairs are needed, that there is money available to pay for that. And again, I have had projects where that stormwater surety is in excess of $100,000. And uh, if, if any of you are familiar with uh, construction bonds, that sort of thing, this is not a bond. This would actually be taking that money, putting it in an escrow account. So in other words, it is a hard project cost that rides with the land forever. And then, of course, we have building construction costs. Um, there's a reason that most of the new Multifamily projects that you're seeing going in and around downtown are about five stories. And that is, you can build a five-story building uh, with a concrete podium for a parking deck, as they call it, uh, by using stick frame construction, uh, wood studs, steel studs, things of that nature. And there is a cost advantage to bringing something to market using stick frame construction rather than going to a heavier form of construction. And of course, in a competitive marketplace, if the first developer out of the gate is building with stick frame construction and he can build it for X dollars per square foot, the next developer who's bringing that same product to the market is not going to develop a more expensive construction type because he's going to be at a competitive disadvantage bringing his project to the marketplace. So once you go beyond five stories up to seven stories, you get into a different construction type, different, more robust type of construction, more elevators, things of that nature, which increase the cost of construction per square foot or the way we would look at it per unit. There's another big break when you go over roughly seven stories or 75 feet, and that is you get into what's called high-rise construction, which is a much more robust and expensive form of construction. So for instance, even though our downtown uh, design district allows buildings to be more than 75 feet tall, it's only a rare occasion where people are proposing to do that because of the really higher cost of construction to bringing that to market. That would be a very special building. But the building costs, as you can see, are variable, but a large part of the project. Beyond the building, then, we have on-site development costs. Um, Again, this, because we're looking at, at doing a denser development and because parking is a requirement, parking is a given, unless we're in the downtown district, you have to require parking. Whether it's affordable or not affordable, you need to provide a parking space for those units. Um, so that adds up into land preparation costs, the demolition, the clearing of the land, the removal of anything else that might be there, the old utilities, things like that. Obviously, we need to have utilities and lighting for the site. You need to have water and sewer and gas and electricity and fiber and storm drainage piping, things of those nature. As I said, we have to have stormwater management. And again, another penalty for going dense is that Rather than a, in a suburban scenario where we can generally handle stormwater management through the design of a, a rain garden or a pond or a wetland or something like that, which is on the ground and less expensive, when we get into an urban environment and a dense type of development, that stormwater management is generally underground. It's under your parking deck or it's under a uh, small corner parking area, something like that. 
And what that is, that drives the cost of those stormwater management devices up from seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars to many, many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And again, this goes back to the high cost of those stormwater surety fees that I referenced a little bit earlier. We still have uh, tree requirements, some landscaping, that sort of sort of thing that, that adds to the cost. Um, depending on what zoning district we're in, we actually may have tree coverage requirements to do some replanting and reforestation. Uh, there's costs for ref refuse handling, obviously, and site amenities. As Pat said, um, these, uh, these fancy, fancy projects, the highly amenitized ones, um, any market rate project is going to really want to bring something to the table, whatever that might be, whether it's a swimming pool or a, a rooftop deck or, or something like that. I'll let the architects talk about that. So, see, all of these quickly add up to uh, a, a good number of, of costs. And I'll go back to parking just, just a second. Um, in a typical suburban environment or a lower intensity development, you can develop a surface parking lot, which you see most of the suburban projects having. You can develop a surface parking lot for roughly $1,000 $1,500 per parking space. When you start getting into a denser type of construction and you're doing a parking deck, structured parking, and think of, uh, you've all watched these, uh, these new apartment projects going up around downtown, uh, uh, 605 West, West Village Phase 2, uh, West Whetstone project uh, just on the other side of the, the Durham station, some of the ones over on 9th Street. Typically, they're developing a, a parking deck with building wrapped around it, which is a very nice form of design because it finds that science. But those parking spaces in a structured format are about $15,000 a space. So you can see the cost of parking goes up by a factor of 10. If you're in a really dense environment, and you actually have to start going down, I have seen those parking space costs at the end of the day be as much as forty-five dollars or $50,000 a piece. Um, the Greenbridge project in Chapel Hill you may be familiar with, they went two stories down below ground. At the end of the day, those parking spaces ended up being about $45,000 a piece. So there's a big site development cost in adding parking. So parking is an issue that, that could be discussed. Uh, in, is in terms of if, how do you mitigate some of these site costs. And then we have off-site development costs. Uh, you don't think about this a lot of times, but um, even relatively low density projects in and around downtown Durham and some of the neighborhoods um, are, are needing to meet modern codes for fire flow, things of that nature that our old infrastructure cannot handle. Pat mentioned yeah. SASE project. That's one of the things that SASE is looking at is whether or not we have adequate infrastructure at these station sites to, to afford this. But there may be off-site development costs, and I've run into these to uh, replace or upgrade off-site water lines as much as you know uh, three to four blocks away from a project, just to make sure that we have adequate water pressure to fight fires and and, and sprinkler systems and things of that nature. Um, particularly at some of the more remote station sites, we may not have all of the water and sewer and storm infrastructure in place yet at those locations, so there will be a cost to bring it to them. Typically those are borne by the developer. Um, there are typically always going to be off-site road improvements. Um, any project of size is going to require that a traffic engineer do a traffic impact analysis, and what they're doing is they're identifying where the proposed development is overburdening the current road network uh, sometimes as much as a mile away from the project site. And those costs could include adding turn lanes, retiming signals, adding new signals, uh, restriping. So we've had projects where that has added up to millions and millions of dollars. And of course, because um, the size of the project, the scale of the project in terms of number of units is directly proportional to the number of cars that are going to be going in and out of that project. The more units you add, the more burden there is potentially going to be on that road network and potentially the more off-site uh, road improvements that you're going to entail. And obviously there's the, the, the good things that, that we need to do and we have to do but all make for a good, good neighborhood and that is 
uh, to provide sidewalks. Sometimes we do sidewalks that aren't even uh, in front of the project, just so we can make good connections to the transit stations and, and bus bus uh, shelters, that sort of thing. Streetscape amenities in terms of the, the nice uh, sidewalks with brick patches we have around downtown now, and trees and grates and uh, benches and uh, trash cans and bike racks and all all things all things of that nature. All good things, but all add up to the cost. And obviously then there are marketing costs. This is not my daily wick. I don't know, you know what all goes into that, but I know it, it can be a substantial portion of the project. And uh, finally, there's profit. And uh, lest you think that profit is optional uh, in a development, uh, I will assure you it is not. Uh, profit is also sometimes the, the thing that gets squeezed as these development costs go up and you run into unknown factors. But I will also tell you that if Mr. Deves, Mr. or Mrs. Developer go to the bank and they have not actually put sufficient profit in their pro forma, in their business plan, the bank will send them packing. They won't finance the project, and then we don't have a project. So that has to be an important component. So what does this all mean? What it means is we have the relative costs, and then we have to offset that with revenue. And a traditional market rate project that does not have an affordable housing component, those all balance out at the end of the day. But if we incorporate an affordable housing component with the market rate component, then we have a revenue gap that we need to figure out how to offset so that we can build that project, bring it to market, and provide those affordable units. And that, in essence, is the task that we're going to be moving forward on over the next couple of months or more, and that is how do we offset development costs or an offset of revenue so that we can create a doable, appreciable incentive for the private development community to say, yes, I will incorporate affordable housing in this project that I'm bringing to market. Because many of you may know, we have a density bonus in our current ordinance that's been on the books for how many years now here? Well, 12 years. And how many affordable units have been created through that? Zero. Zero. So what we have is not working. And so the task at hand is let's have this conversation. Every one of these development cost items and the equity gap items are potential opportunities for infusing something that will help offset the cost of bringing that to market to close that equity gap. Time is a factor, as we said. The cost of the land may be a factor. Um, building construction costs, maybe to some extent, but those aren't necessarily controlled by Durham. Those are building codes that are written by the state and, and other folks. Uh, Off-site development costs, impact fees. I think you could take anything on that list and we can have a conversation about whether or not there is a way to infuse cash or offset some of those development costs so that we can close that red gap to the point where we do create a appreciable incentive a program so that we can get affordable housing where we need it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Aaron Kane, and he's going to take us on a little bit of a journey about how we're going to get there. Thanks, Dan. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about... No, that did not work. There we go. What I want to talk about today are just some options. And this is just the start of a community discussion that we'll be having over the next at least few months. Um, I don't want anybody to take away, oh, these are our only options, or these are the right ones or the wrong ones. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about just giving you all some ideas to further the discussion, talk about some pros and cons, um, to as we move forward, both with the community and the elected officials and how we want to address this issue. Um, Dan stole a little bit of my thunder on this. Uh, yes, we do have a current affordable housing 
incentive. It's essentially what it is, is if you will provide one affordable unit to somebody who meets the 60% AMI threshold, earns 60% of the area median income, you can build an additional market rate unit above the density that you're allowed. And as Dan alluded to, nobody's ever used it before. It's basically not a strong enough incentive. It doesn't provide um, enough of a profit for private development to fund the affordable housing. So as Dan talked about, how do we fill that equity gap? How do we provide some sort of incentives to the private market, whether it's, again, whether it's private sector, whether it's nonprofit, whether it's public sector, to provide these affordable units that we're looking for in our transit areas? Um, basically, two ways to do that. One is we would decrease costs or somehow increase revenues. And what I've got up here are simply a list of options that we can discuss as a community. And there are others besides these, but these are some of the more popular ones. Um, by right zoning, Dan talked about time is money for a development project. Um, having a developer go through a rezoning process takes in Durham usually a minimum of six months, can take up to a year. That is additional cost to development if we're looking to uh, have areas with higher density and affordable housing, that is one way we can look at decreasing those costs. Impact fee rebates or reductions would be another. Uh, Dan mentioned a bunch of those costs, transportation, open space, parks and recreation, and so forth. Is that something that we as a community would be willing to accept less money for in return for affordable units being constructed? Um, provision of infrastructure. The SASE project is looking at not only where, what types of infrastructure do we need to provide to optimize the future rail system, but also looking at options for financing that. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be very expensive. But if some of that infrastructure is provided by the public sector, then that reduces the cost of the private sector, which could be directed to affordable housing. Um, land banking. And land banking, most people think of as a purchase of land. Let's purchase the land now while it's less expensive before the trade system comes in and drives up those land prices, as Pat talked about. But land banking could also be looking at land that is already owned by the public sector or by nonprofits in these areas and holding on to that or making sure that might get set aside for affordable housing provision. And then also reduce requirements. Do we want to, uh, that was one thing Dan talked about was parking. If you're looking at dense development, these uh, off street parking goes in depth, it's very expensive. Do we want to look at reducing our off-street parking requirements, we want to look at reducing our transportation requirements, or maybe even our design requirements. These are all things that are on the table as we move forward. Uh, increasing revenues is another option. We've tried the density bonus. Density bonuses can work in some communities that have very strong markets. Um, we've seen successful uh, density bonuses happen in places like D.C. suburbs, San Diego, Seattle, San Francisco. But those aren't quite the same market that we have here in Durham, and they're also much stronger density bonuses, two to one, three to one, even up to five to one. So we're talking about a greater amount of density. Is that something we're willing to accept as a community, something we need to talk about? Uh, development options and also direct participation. Is this something where the city, the county, other ways of finding revenue might actually infuse capital into a development project? Uh, in return for affordable units. And then also coordination of economic development incentives. We do have an economic development program through the city and the county. Do we want to look at maybe tying that into some of these affordable projects? So what the city and the county manager's offices have directed us to do is look at a four-part strategy for addressing these. And the community discussion will be a part of this four-part strategy. Uh, development options and also direct participation. Is this something where the city, the county, other ways of finding revenue might actually infuse capital into a development project uh, in return for affordable units? And then also coordination of economic development incentives. We do have an economic development program through the city and the county. Do we want to look at maybe tying that into some of these affordable projects? So what the city and the county manager's offices have directed us to do is look at a four-part strategy for addressing these. And the community discussion will be a part of this four-part strategy. 
uh, the Institution of Design Districts, a, coming up with a long-term funding toolbox that we can use to address this issue over time, uh, potential regulatory incentives, and then also direction of federal and state resources on those three titles. So what are design districts? I think Pat and Dan both talked about this a little bit in their presentations. Uh, design districts are what we've implemented in downtown and in the Ninth Street area. And the policy that we've had for a few years now from the city and the county is to apply these design districts to all of our rail transit areas. It's a zoning scheme that says that, that basically creates a four-base code. Uh, if you follow certain regulatory requirements and you design the project successfully, you will be approved. You don't need to go through a rezoning and you don't need to go through a community input session on that. What we do is instead on the front end have a much longer conversation with the community around that rail transit area and setting up those standards. So we set up the standards for the community. We did this in Ninth Street. It took about three to five years. Is that all right. I think five years from when we first had the first community input session to the time we actually got the standards approved. So we go through a lengthy community input session then, and then um, projects are approved more easily through an administrative process. We'll talk about that a little bit in more detail. But one of the purposes of this is to make sure that we have the appropriate density and design around our rail stations, as both Pat and Dan said. Job number one here is making sure we're able to get the rail transit system working. And one of the best things we can do to ensure that our application to the federal government is successful is to make sure that we have the appropriate density and design around those stations. But there's a lot of work up front with the community and a lengthy process to make sure everybody's on board with those standards before we move forward. On the legislative side, there is greater community control on individual products, greater community input on individual products, projects. However, one project could be having to require to do some things, one project might have to do another because each one gets approved individually. So it also lengthens the time and the uncertainty for the development community. Moving on to the long-term funding toolbox and some of the things, and again, this is just a, a somewhat a, a list of options. There could be other things we could look at. But I think the top ones are the ones we want to look at the most. Uh, affordable housing retention strategies. As Pat showed, we already have quite a bit of affordable housing around some of our transit stations. And one of the most cost-effective ways that we could go about, make, go about making sure there's affordable housing in those areas is to keep that affordable housing is to come up with ways to keep that from flipping over into something more expensive and being redeveloped. So we want to look at ways that we might be able to do that. Value capture is something that we're looking at in the SASE. How do, what value capture means is that you take the value of the land as it is now, and then you see after it's rezoned, after it's redeveloped, what the new land values are. I think, uh, Pat, if I had that number right, it was 81% higher over 10 years in some areas. What you do is you take that difference and then you redirect that difference of tax revenue into certain projects that are going to spend, be spent in that area. That could be infrastructure, that could be provision of affordable housing. So something we'll want to look at. Land banking I've already discussed. LIHTC is low income housing tax credits because we as the city and county try to help direct those projects that apply for low income housing tax credits into transit areas. So these are again just a few options that we have moving forward. Regulatory incentives, we've had regulatory incentives for over a decade, they haven't worked. So, but they are popular in a lot of places. Why? Well, Chapel Hill uses them, they're not this expensive. The private sector bears most of the burden of the provisions. Um, and they're usually by right for the developer. If you will build the affordable housing, you get these bonuses. However, strictly voluntary, it only tends to work, as I mentioned before, in very strong markets. Um, and they don't have to be taken. There's no guarantee if we provide some regulatory incentive, there's no guarantee that anybody will ever take them. That's my experience. Some regulatory incentive examples that we see across the country, the ones in blue on the left are ones that are more popular and have been more effective in other places. Height um, increases, density increases, reduction of parking, um, reduction of some uh, design criteria that might make the building more expensive to construct and making sure that these are by right, that you don't have to get a separate uh, council approval to move forward. 
Some things on the, on the right in red are things that we've seen haven't worked anywhere. Uh, setback reductions, landscaping reductions, a density bonus that's too low to make it profitable for the developer, and permit fees, reductions, and waivers. Those tend to be such a small portion of a development's cost that they haven't really been affected. And then finally, the fourth part of our strategy is the HUD consolidated plan. Uh, every five years, the city's community development department uh, submits a five-year plan to the federal department of uh, housing and urban development to tell them how they're going to spend three main federal sources of dollars, community development block grants, home funds, and emergency shelter grants. Um, the first two especially can be de devoted to affordable housing. One thing we can explore is devoting some of that funding in the future plan to transit areas to help ensure that there's affordable housing for that system. Um, that next, uh, Wilmer, you're going to correct me, 2015 is the next one that's due, so sometime next year, correct? Correct. And with that, I would like to turn it over to the panel discussion. We've got five folks who are going to come up here and be able to answer your questions. I've also got the contact information up here for Patrick and myself. On the bottom is our website for the city. If you direct yourself to the planning department, I don't know how long it's going to take us, um, but we will eventually have this presentation as well as a video of today's session for any of you to see in the future. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that, and thank you, Dan. Um, we are very fortunate today, um, and we're very fortunate in Durham. We have folks that have amazing knowledge and resources in this subject matter area, five of which are sitting in front of you now. I'll introduce uh, each of them from my right to my left. Um, before I do that, I want to remind you that you have uh, two index cards that were handed to you on the way in. And uh, if you have any questions for our panel, uh, if you would write those down on the card with the lines on it, uh, our staff, Ms. Black and Ms. Willard, will come by and pick up those cards and pass them to the end of the table. Uh, we'll try to get as many questions as we can in, in the time we have. So on my far right is Kim Cameron. Kim is the Director of Real Estate for Self-Help, which provides strategic leadership to the 15-member real estate team uh, of Self-Help. Kim directs and manages the commercial and residential investment portfolio and all related real estate development projects to include sales, lease projects, oversight, asset management, and facilities maintenance. She has over 20 years of experience in community development and has worked on projects that uh, serve as a catalyst for revitalization in neighborhoods in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Atlanta, Georgia. So welcome, Kim Cameron. <laughs> to Kim's left, we have Ms. Karen Leto. Uh, Karen is the Vice President for Enterprise Community Partners, which is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to creating opportunities for low and moderate income people uh, through affordable housing in diverse and thriving communities. Um, Karen's also a recent uh, relocatee to Durham. She brings over 20 years of experience in community development, research, project management, and consulting uh, to her current role. Let's hear it for Karen Lee. And then to Karen's left is uh, Shannon McLean. Shannon is the Chief Development and Operations Officer for the Durham Housing Authority. She has extensive, uh, over 17 years of experience in housing and development uh, industry. She's worked with the Housing Authority uh, multiple positions, including uh, Director of Development Real Estate uh, Strategies. Um, and Ms. McLean also served as a Senior Program Specialist and Federal Programs Manager uh, with the City of Durham for two and a half years. So welcome, Shannon. And Dan Jewell, you heard from earlier. Dan's a local landscape architect, co-founder of Coulter Jewel Thames, PA. Uh, it's like a design firm right here in downtown Durham. Uh, Dan and his firm have been involved in the design of various uh, landmarks here in Durham, American Tobacco District, Rowan Terrace, Bright Leaf Square, and a large role in the creation of Durham, Durham Central Park. Uh, Dan is co-founder of the Durham Area Designers and has served as North Carolina Chapter President of the American Society of Landscape Architects. So for Dan Jewell. <laughs> last but not least, Ms. Selena Mack, who is the Executive Director of the Durham Community Land Trust. Uh, she has provided key leadership of the DCL team through many ups and downs. Uh, most notably through its expansion of commercial and real estate uh, rental housing development projects. And uh, under her leadership, DCLT has uh, completed over 200 units of permanently affordable housing here in Durham. Selena Mack. I'm going to 
kick off a couple questions we came up with the staff while your questions are being collected. Um, and again, like I said, we'll get to as many as we can and try to get you out here at 9.30. I'm going to address this first question to anyone on the panel who wants to, to take it. Um, what are some of the financing or, or value capture tools that have been used uh, most successfully in other cities to help up the, the equity gap that you heard Dan and Aaron both talk about? We'll start with Kim. Um, I'll give a quick two-minute response. Uh, you heard my introduction. I've done this in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, in Atlanta, we use uh, urban enterprise zones. And I know that's not allowable or legal in North Carolina, but it was a big incentive. It was a 10-year property tax abatement for um, developers to uh, include 50% AMI um, affordable housing in in either mixed-use developments or multi-family developments. Uh, and again, it, it started out with full five-year property tax abatement and then leveled off to, we got to 100% by uh, year 11. Also, uh, tax incremental financing and then the availability to compete in an open and competitive process with the local housing authority for project-based uh, housing choice vouchers. To, for the lower 30% AMI affordability units. And I'll um, add on to those and, and say, I think one of the key things as you think about affordability is to really understand what, the, what affordability is needed, who you're trying to serve, and what the roles are of different players in the system. Um, one very important strategy that, that Durham has an option to look at right now is really in this value capture arena. Um, Durham is looking at doing an upzoning of property um, around transit corridors. Upzoning means that you're going to make it denser, you're going to allow higher density than it's currently allowed. At the moment that Durham does that, there's creation of economic value. The land is now worth more because you can do more with it. And that economic value is being created strictly because of public sector investment in the zoning and in transit. And there is a very strong argument to me, and I, I certainly can make it, which is the public sector has a right and an obligation to ensure that that value that is created inures, at least in part, to the public sector and to the people who most need it and who are most likely to be harmed um, on the downside if it is wrong. One way to get at this is, I mean, inclusionary zoning is something that's discussed where you have a requirement. If you build more than 30 minutes, 10% must get affordable. You can't do that in North Carolina. And, and frankly, this is not, not the right kind of city to have a city-wide inclusionary zoning ordinance. Um, but what we, we could think about doing is, in, um, in areas where we're going to have significant upzoning, only allow that density increase in return for some contribution to affordability. And that can be either the creation of affordable units as part of development, it can be the payment of a fee into a, a fund that's then used to fill this equity gap by commercial or retail developers who aren't building housing, or even by, by um, rental housing developers. Because you can really only get 60% area median income, sort of moderately priced rental units, using kind of a market-driven strategy. If you want to be more deeply subsidized, you need to think otherwise. So I would say the option ahead of us is to say, can we create a buy-right system that allows developers to have more density than they could otherwise have, and you basically only allows the density that people want um, in return for affordability. And this is something that's been done in Arlington and Fairfax. There is some, some track record for it, and I think what's going on in 9th Street and in um, downtown is the case that Durham is, is no longer the first stepchild of the triangle area, that there is a real um, interest in investing in this community, and there's a real market in the end. Good morning. Um, I have not worked in another city, but um, in addition to the Section 8 vouchers, that would be a potential or opportunity um, for the development. You also have, um, on the public housing side, there's a fair cloth limit that is set for each housing authority. Um, so, for example, if our fair cloth limit is 2,100 units and we only have 1,800, that would allow for additional public housing units to be integrated into the developments as well. 
financing is not my strong suit other than trying to get my clients to pay me. So I <laughs> <laughs> And the good thing about going last is that everybody else has already, um, <laughs> I'll give you quite a list, but you know, my list would just be um, to increase the number of resident control um, limited equity housing um, projects in the, in the target areas. Thank you all much. So, uh, Aaron talked about and Karen alluded to the idea of value capture. Uh, and clearly you can, you can do that on the front side or the back side or both. And so um, in terms of uh, how value capture relates to the two different approaches to zoning that Aaron outlined, the two basic approaches, you see this in the triangle, are, um, as Aaron talked about, uh, have almost every development subject to a uh, discretionary approval process and have the upzoning be the primary method of value capture versus a system that identifies the area the community wants to have higher density, allows higher density and intensity, mix of uses by right, and does value capture more in the back end. What are some of the trade-offs between these two approaches, and what, and what factors might cause a community to, to pick one or the other or try to find a way to do both? So whoever wants to touch that one. So, um, I mean, the trade-offs between the two are if you put the zoning out by right with no sort of affordability requirement, then the value is gone. The value is out there, and, and the only way the public sector can um, benefit from it is basically eating into its own revenue through a tax increment financing strategy, which, again, is worth pursuing, um, absolutely. If you do it from a discretionary basis, um, and I just recently moved from Colorado, we're in a transit bill that, and our chapel hill is Boulder, Colorado, where everything is, is, is negotiated you make every transaction more expensive because it takes longer and it's much more unpredictable and developers hate unpredictability because they're already, you know, it's a very risky business, it's very expensive and you're just making it harder for them. Um, I would say that there is a middle ground and that, that would be certainly what I would argue for which is you make very clear rules of the game that are by right but only by right with the provision of specific benefits for support health. But once those benefits are provided, it's a buy-right development, the developer knows exactly what to expect and can then can then move forward and plan accordingly. And that, that incentive, so that they can either develop by right at a lower density, or they can develop by right at a higher density in return for um, affordability, contribution to affordability. And that that contribution is very very clearly specified, and, and um, that then the development process is predictable, and the cost can be modeled, and that and that incentive has to be powerful enough to compensate for the cost for that gap that Dan talked about, which is very real. Um, the reason the market doesn't provide affordable housing is because there is no market rate return on affordable housing. The only way to make it happen is to find some way. To allow a market, and the only way to happen and have a private developer deliver it is to ensure that that market rate return can happen. Karen's a lot smarter than I am on this, and she raises some excellent points. Um, my uh, the, the thing we need to make absolutely sure of is that we don't give an opt out option because at these transit station sites, at in these transit neighborhoods, we want the density. We need the density don't get the density, we won't have transit. And that's why I think, uh, and you started alluding to this, that in order to close that equity gap, rather than saying, Mr. Developer, Mrs. Developer, you can either build this much or you can build this much if you provide an affordable component, I fear that without the infusion of other incentives, we're going to see the developer um, has allowed us to develop housing for homeless populations. Um, so we have had a couple of very successful relationships with the city of Durham um, and self help. So certainly we have also had similar local partnership, um, private local, um, private partner, private public partnership. Sorry, um, with self help and obviously um, you know, with the city of Durham. Um, uh, Make way Square is certainly one of those, um, which is housing for seniors um, that we developed in partnership with Self Help and with a uh, Raleigh, uh, another non a Raleigh nonprofit called Durham um, DHIC. 
Um, but I also want to kind of also kind of reference the what's happening I mean, in Chapel Hill. I don't know if there's anybody here that can speak to this, um, but you know, in Chapel Hill, the the developers that we talked about earlier that are you know that are actually I won't say required, but are more or less required to put um, either build affordable housing units within their own development or provide um, funding or provide funds that then go into a, a, a fund for the creation of other affordable housing units. Um, those 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 uh, private entities are actually being uh, developed, or the public entities on the uh, affordable units are actually being developed by their local community land trusts or just community housing trusts um, in Chapel Hill. Um, so they are they are actually functioning as the developer um, of those uh, affordable housing units. So even though, when I say developer, I mean even when those units are actually being developed by by the actual private developer, those units are then turned over to the community land trust and they are it's their responsibility to to sell them in the um, you know, and to, and to provide the ongoing stewardship for those units. And uh, I would venture to say that something similar um, to that could also happen here in Durham. Looks like we have more time for one more question. Um, I'll repeat quickly what Aaron said. Um, the presentation you saw in a video of this entire session will be on our website, hopefully by the end of the day, certainly in the next day or two. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to Aaron or I. Again, this is just the beginning. And I want to, before we break up, I want to thank our panel. So uh, we've got a question about um, we, we, the focus of today's session has been around rail stations and how to ensure affordable housing is within a half mile of those stations. But um, are there examples of where um, bus hubs or, or bus hubs that feed into these transit areas have also been successful sites for affordable housing development and what are some unique considerations that go along with, with that type of development? So I would say the answer is, is yes. Um, I recently moved from Denver which is in um, the midst of a very large transit expansion that includes both bus and rail. And the reality is there are there is one bus corridor in Denver that now carries more traffic than any single light rail line. I'm looking at a former colleague on your pedigree from Denver. Um, than any single light rail line will ever carry when it's at, at, at max. And that, that's the longest state highway in the, in the country, um, Colfax Boulevard. And um, every every city has a Colfax Boulevard. I would, you know, it's kind of that commercial, old commercial corridor that doesn't quite get revitalized. Um, and that has become a very prime target for transit development because it is both a major bus corridor and um, it links to the light rail system in several points. Um, I would say that the, um, when you think about bus rapid transit, or not bus rapid transit, when you, when you think about bus oriented transit development, the key factors to consider are frequency of service. It can't just be the bus comes twice an hour, it has to be a major bus corridor. Um, and what does that bus corridor connect you to? Um, and then I think the second piece is, I think that the catchment area, we, we sort of think about a half mile radius for a fixed, um, for a transit station. I think when you start thinking about a bus corridor, that probably shrinks a little bit. Um, we used a rule of thumb of a quarter of a mile. I don't think there's any magic to these numbers. Um, but they can be very they can be very valuable and they can be important targets in particular um, for preservation opportunities as well as new construction because where bus is most relevant is often in most communities. In the interest of getting you all out on time, we're, we're going to make that the last question. There were a lot of questions we couldn't get to that were excellent. On our website, we're going to have the presentation and video of this, and we'll begin to do, uh, answer any questions we receive today or, or in the future. Um, I'm sorry, Don. Just have people drop their name tags. Yeah, if you, if you would please drop your name tags out of the back. And any questions that you didn't get to um, formulate, if you want to drop them in the green bag on the way out. Let's thank our panel, please. And thank each of you again for taking the time to come out today. We look forward to working with you on this in the future. Thanks very much.